Hello. Hi, I'm Hayes Raffle. I'm here today with uh, three colleagues I've been working with for a long time. Bob Ricecamp, Emmett Connolly, and Alex Faborg. Actually, the four of us go back a long time in different ways. Alex and I were at the MIT Media Lab together about 10 years ago. And Bob and Emmett were on the watch design team, I think about three years ago, doing the very early design iterations of Android Wear. And now Alex and Emmett work together on the Wear team, and Bob and I have been working on Glass for about three years. And you guys are sort of getting four for the price of one today. We're here to share with you some of the things that we've learned along the way. Because over the last three or four years, we've been finding our way through this new space of wearables and trying to understand what it means, what works, and what direction it makes sense to go in this new space. And so I wanted to start with a little bit of philosophy, some of the things that we've found useful uh, as we've worked through this space. And a couple of the things that have been most helpful for me are some of the things that Sergey and Larry have talked about over the years. Larry talks about how technology should do the hard work, and you should have a chance to live, have a good life, and get on with it. And that's great. And you see that in products like Google Search that try and get you what you need and get out of the way as fast as possible. And and Sergey talks about how computing needs to be more comfortable. And on their surface, these might actually seem like different statements. One is about form, the other one's about function. But they're really the same idea. And the idea is that computing should start to disappear. It should fade into the background of our lives. It should be ephemeral, not the foreground of our attention all the time. Because life is beautiful. It's full of beautiful people and puppies and sunsets and things that are just really lovely. And computing shouldn't be taking us away from that. It should be helping to bring us closer to it, if anything. And so one of the phrases that we use a lot when we're doing design is we talk about the world being the experience. The user experience, the experience with the product, could never possibly compete with the beautiful things around you. At best, it can provide timely information and help and things that can help you be connected to others and be connected to the moment that you're in. And you see that in lots of aspects of the design of the products that we're building. You see it in the placement of the glass display. It's not in front of you. It's off on the periphery. You see that even in the font weights. Very thin, light strokes with a black background, which shows up as transparent on the glass display. You see that in some of the use cases. Some of my favorites, this one of Sebastian Thrun swinging his son around in a circle right after we got the camera working on glass a couple years ago and showing how technology could really help transport us into that moment of joy that he was having with his three-year-old. This is what it means when we say the world is the experience. And now back, my background actually is in fine art. And the thing that I care most about when I do my work is creating a sense of empathy between people, getting people closer together. Because while we talk so much at Google about the user experience and designing for the user, none of us live in isolation. We live in a world surrounded by people that we care about. And how can technology help to bring us closer to others? And I want to show you a couple examples that I think are starting to get in that direction. This is a picture of a journalist named Tim Poole. Tim works for Vice Magazine. And about a year ago, he was in the streets of Istanbul documenting the riots that were happening there and broadcasting live from glass to a huge viewer base that he has. And Tim's been doing this for a long time with cameras on his shoulder with his cell phone, now with glass. And I think for me, the transformative thing that's happening is that glass is allowing him to interview people in a more intimate way. When he talks to people in the street and with glass, they're not talking to his camera, they're talking to him. And what that means is that when you're watching that broadcast from far away and trying to understand what's happening in Istanbul, you're that much closer to the action, you're that much closer to the way that people are feeling in the streets there. There's another thing that we think a lot about with wearables and this idea of being connected. Wearables themselves are very, very intimate. You're wearing them on your body. In fact, these glasses are so specially designed for me. If you put them on, you probably can't see them because I have my prescription on them. They're very hard to share. And on the same token, the way that we design the experience for wearables needs to be very personal. It needs to reflect the things about me as the wearer that I find important. It needs to be about the closest people the people that I care about who are close both in time and in space, whether it's my family or you who are in this room with me right now. 
It's about surfacing the information from the people you care about in a way that feels personal to you. It's about being able to bring your niece to her grandmother's birthday party to see 100 candles get blown out, even if she couldn't be there in person. Again, this is what we mean by the world is the experience. Now, one of the tactics that we talk about, like, how do you do this? And we're going to talk about some different ways today. But the first one that I want to talk about is called micro-interactions. And the idea with micro-interactions is that wearables are on the periphery. You're not designing the windshield. You're designing what goes in the rear view mirror. Because whatever is happening in front of the user in their life is going to be demanding, it's going to be happening fast, and it's going to need most of their attention. And whatever you're giving them needs to be very glanceable. And this idea of glanceability is really about getting to the essence of the information that that person needs in the time and the place that they are. And so what does that mean in how you design software? Well, if you look at driving directions on glass, when you ask for directions, for the most part, the screen is turned off. But before you have to turn, it'll turn on and tell you, turn right on Greenwich Avenue in 100 feet, show you a map of where you need to go, and then after you've completed the turn, disappear again. This is glanceable. This is what it means to be the rear view mirror, not the windshield. It means when you're designing a messaging app for the watch, how minimal can you make it? What is the simplest amount of information that the user needs to get the task completed? Here's two designs. And the big difference between them is that one of them has twice as much information as the other one. On the left, six pieces of information to, for a user to look at. On the right, only three. That difference is about 900 milliseconds of attention for someone who's focused. Now, 900 milliseconds, why would you care about that? Well, you have to remember, this person's wearing it on their wrist. They might be running to the next meeting. Which one of these would you rather have if you're running <laughs> to the next session in room seven? We've even played around with, you know, could we put an emulator like this? Um, into the, into the t developer tools so that you could play with this. But I think the real idea, and Timothy mentioned it earlier, is that none of this stuff is particularly intuitive. It's taken us a long time to get to the, where, we're, where we're at today, and there's certainly a long way to go still. And the way that we make progress is by continually testing on the device in the context where we mean to use these things. This is sort of a paradigm shift, I think, because if you look at the way that people use their phones today, People get out their phone, and then they do their task, and then they get distracted by a lot of other things that are there. They get lost in their phone, and they are taken out of the world. And what we're trying to do with wearables is actually get to a place where people have the same utility and benefit from computing, but there's actually less computing in their life because we've designed experiences for them that are much more compact so they can get in and out, get their goal completed. Put another way, I think our job now as designers and developers is to create experiences that are as short as possible, as fast as possible, to complete the task that the user needs to do. So we're going to talk more about different strategies that we've developed and ideas we have to do that. And I want to turn over the stage now to Bob, who's going to talk about some of the things he's learned about voice. Bob's been wearing computers since they weren't quite so wearable, and so he has a lot of perspective on it. Thanks, Hayes. So ever since the bike helmet days, uh, we've been designing our wearable products to help you be more engaged with the real world. And one way that we've done that is through creating natural language voice interfaces for our products. Uh, we've tried a lot of different interaction techniques for wear and for glass. And one thing we found is that when you can speak naturally to a device, just like you and I could talk, uh, it makes your interactions much faster. It makes it much easier to stay connected to the people you're with and the places you're in. And for wearables, this is even more important than for some other devices. For instance, uh, Hayes and I both love to go cycling. And this is a fantastic place in the world to go cycling. Uh, it's a sport that's all about the outdoors, but it's also got a bunch of just amazing technology that you can really get into. Um, 
And it's, it's an example of an activity where, like Hayes said, the world is the experience, and it's very, very important to pay attention to it. And I also love my phone. Um, but that same gorgeous phone interface that works so well when I'm sitting and standing doesn't work as well when I'm active. Uh, maybe my hands are sweaty, I'm trying to ride at the same time, uh, trying to hit those small icons on a screen, uh, maybe the sun is, is causing some glare. So we felt that glass and wearables could be great to use while cycling. You know, you can use, keep your hands on the handlebars, you can keep your eyes on the road, it works with your voice. But when we first started designing the interfaces for glass, we tried to use a lot of the same interaction and visual design patterns that we knew from designing for phones and desktops. Uh, we had a screen, we put it roughly in the middle of your perspective. Uh, you'd first try to choose an app to run, and then you'd select a few features, uh, you'd choose an option, and maybe finally you could view individual items, you could input some information. And with all of those steps, we found that we weren't really getting a different experience from the phone. Uh, you still have to think about what's the structure of my operating system and what features does each app have and where do I input those, those information into those fields. Now this is a very powerful system, which is why we use it on desktops and phones. Um, but it didn't feel appropriate for a wearable device. And when you step back and, and think about it, when you're engaged with the real world, your interactions aren't like that. If you're cycling with a group of friends, um, you're not opening menu options and clicking buttons, you're looking at people and you're talking to them. You're seeing things, you point at them, you reach for things and hold them. You know, these are all very natural interactions. You don't need a manual to tell you how to do them. And so we wanted as much as possible to make our experiences on wearables more like that. For instance, we designed the messaging experience on Glass to be as close as possible to the way you'd talk to a close friend. Okay, Glass, send a message to Jane Williams. Hey, Jane, it's great to see you today. You know, we even show a photo of the person in the background while you're talking. Overall, we wanted to make it feel like that face-to-face -face conversation, except now you could do it across time and space. Now, this cuts out a whole bunch of the decisions and steps required to do that same action on a phone or a desktop. And it turns out to be tremendously faster than pulling your phone out and manipulating all those options. That's because when we designed the messaging glassware, we chose just a single experience, sending one message to a single contact. And we designed a unique voice command and a unique flow for just that experience. Now, if you want to look at an older message or you want to edit your contacts, uh, you want to do any of the other things you think of belong in a messaging application, you can do those in other ways in other places. But this experience is very singular and very focused. You do just one thing at a time, and you see just one thing at a time. And with Android Wear, we wanted to bring that same kind of experience to a lot more devices. Um, as you saw in today's keynote, if you have a car service or ride sharing application installed, you can simply speak a command. OK, Google, call me a car. You know, it's a simple, natural language command. It instantly gets a car headed your way. Again, it's almost like you're able to talk across the city directly to the driver. So one thing you can do to make your wearable interface more natural is to carefully design that voice experience. You know, don't just port over the structure of your app from your mobile device or your desktop. Think very carefully about what's that individual short experience that people want to have. And break up that big app into individual flows. And then you can design and craft one single voice action just for that flow and just get that person that perfect experience. And make that as much like normal speech as possible. We believe that natural language speech, when it's connected to all the amazing services that all of you are building, is going to make interacting with wearables even easier and faster than using phones and desktops. Um, but you know, this example of calling for a car also does something else uh, to improve the experience, and that's use knowledge about your context and where you are. So I'll next hand over to Emmett, who is one of the founding designers of the Wear project, and he'll walk you through how we've been designing using context. Um, 
Emmett and I worked in Zurich together while he was working on some of these early ideas, so I got to see all of his crazy, embarrassing early prototypes as well. Hi, everyone. So Bob talked about how speaking a command can be one of the fastest and easiest ways of actually performing an action. And I'm going to talk about one way that's potentially even faster than that, and that's to not even speak a command at all. To just have the right information appear automatically based solely on the context that the user is in. So let's rewind for a minute. This is a, a wooden prototype of the PAM pilot that Jeff Hawkins uh, made when they were first de designing and developing it, one of the first portable computers. It's a little stylus, uh, chopstick stylus there. I love that. Um, so before they ever started building anything, uh, Jeff used to carry this around with him every day. And if someone said to him, hey, are you free at 3 o'clock today or whatever, he would pull out his little wooden computer and tap away on it with his chopstick and pretend to actually check if he was free. He would do this every day for months, and what he was actually doing was trying to figure out what it was like to use a device like this, a new type of device at the time, on a day-to-day -day basis and in a regular day-to-day -day context. He was trying to figure out what kind of UI might feel right for this new form factor. And in retrospect, he was trying to avoid a common mistake. It seems like that very often when these new devices come along, we, the, the, the general reaction seems to be to take the dominant paradigm, UI paradigm of the day, and just slap it on these new devices. And the truth is that never really works out all that well. You have these new types of devices, and they're often really begging for some new interface ideas. And to a certain extent, we've seen this play out with the early wearables market as well. A lot of these devices are really just taking the grid of apps and putting it on this tiny screen. And again, we see that this doesn't often really work out so well. To start with, these are really tiny tap targets. And so especially on a moving target, it's hard to hit. Um, you can't see very many of these icons at once, so it's hard to build up a spatial memory of even where everything is located. And it can just take a lot of swiping to go through all these screens and actually access what it is that you're trying to access to even start with your action. So we took a step back from this and we tried to think about what if we didn't require any input at all, that we just had the right information show up at the right time. And this is what we came up with. <laughs> so some of you noticed the subtle detail in this photograph. Yes, it's just a phone strapped to a wrist. Well done. But there is something interesting happening here. Uh, this is an actual prototype that we built. And there's no grid of apps here. There's just one simple, clear piece of information showing up at a time. And if another piece of information comes along, and that's more important for the user to know about, then we'll show that instead. So we kept thinking about this. We thought, what if there's more than one piece of information that's useful to know about? Maybe we could arrange these simple screens as a row or as a group of cards, and you could just uh, rank them and have the most important stuff appear at the top. And you see this thinking today reflected in the philosophy of the Android Wear UI and also of the Glass UI. In both devices, there's just this targeted, relevant piece of information. And in both devices, the way that you interact with them is the same. You're just swiping through this really clear stream of cards. And it feels like roughly the right uh, level of interaction for these devices in terms of the ergonomics, visually how they appear, and just the overall interaction. So that's kind of a nice UI model for wearables. But we still have this problem of how do we know when to show the right piece of information? When do we put this information in front of users? Well, there's something special about these devices. They're packed with these sensors. They're aware of their situation and state they're aware of the context that they're being used in. For example, your application can know where the user is, potentially where they're headed. And then you can ask yourself, what's nearby? What might be useful for the user to know about? Your app obviously knows what time of day it is and what date it is. And the user may have granted permission uh, to access their events and what's important to them coming up. There is, of course, the identity of the user. Uh, their patterns, their preferences, their habits. And then these devices also have uh, motion sensors. 
And because they're worn on the body, we can transfer this uh, raw motion information into activities. And we actually have APIs that are available to you as developers that can sense these simple activities that you can pattern match against. Things like walking, cycling, driving, and so on. These devices are connected, of course, and often to other nearby devices. So you can start to ask questions like, what is the phone doing right now? Is the TV being used? Uh, maybe there's music streaming to the speaker. Uh, maybe the thermostat knows something. And these are all signals that add into this context. And finally, there are additional sensors, some of them built into the wearer. I could get a spare. No, I'm back. OK. Uh, Is it me? I'll try and keep going. Thanks. Um, yeah, so there are nearby devices that can provide uh, other information, perhaps like uh, precise location from Bluetooth beacons. So the real interesting thing happens when we take the combined total of all of this sensor data and put it together into one single rich picture of the user's situation, the scenario that they're in right now. So as developers, we can look at this situation and we can ask ourselves the question, how can we present the user with useful information that will help them? And for you guys as developers, what you can do is define detailed contextual trigger conditions and have your app show up at precisely the right time based on those trigger conditions. So let's look at a practical example now. So first we'll look at a typical interaction as it, as, as it exists today. Let's say you're going for a run. You probably uh, pull out your phone, then you launch a running app, maybe tap in some goals. Um, you might decide to switch over to a music app, queue up that album that you had been listening to earlier, switch back to the running app, uh, tap start so that you can get going, strap the phone onto your arm, and off you go. Fairly typical interaction that we're probably used to. Now we'll try and redesign this experience for wearables using context to drive the interaction. So in this case, assume you're using an Android Wear device. Um, it's a pleasant Sunday afternoon. You're at the head of your running trail that maybe you run at most Sundays. Uh, you probably just stretch out, uh, plug in your headphones, and start running. So based just on these simple inputs from our sensors, the things that we can detect, things like the time, the location, your habits, uh, physical movement, even what the headphone jack is doing, it really looks like this person is going for a run right now. So why shouldn't we do the obvious thing and present them with helpful information? In this case, it would be something like start tracking their run and perhaps also offer to pick up playing that album. So the user didn't have to do very much at all here. They just acted nor as they normally would. And the technology does the right thing automatically. It was like Hayes said, the world is the experience. And the technology just adapts to what the user is doing. So again, rather than asking the user to manually tell the device what they want to do and then have to manage state on an ongoing basis, on wearables, we're going to do something much simpler than that. We're going to do all the heavy lifting for them based on context and present them with just the right information at the right time. So that was a simple example. Next up, Alex is going to talk you through some more examples and also introduce you to some design tools that will help you apply this thinking to your own applications. All right, so that was a lot of information. And this is a new form factor, so that means thinking about building entirely new types of software. But it also means a lot of opportunities to build breakthrough applications because this is a new form factor and we're just getting started. So first, let's summarize. Hayes talked about how the world is the experience, sunsets and puppies and these things that we care about more than having to interact with devices. And how do we achieve the world being the experience? Well, we achieve it by having the user be in the world more. And we can do that through micro-interactions so that you're more present and engaged in the real world. But you're also more connected virtually because you have more check-ins. It's just your engagement with the technology is shorter. How do we make those engagements shorter? How do we achieve micro-interactions? Well, the two core components, voice, as Bob talked about, and context, as Emmett talked about. 
So now you're thinking, okay, that sounds cool, but where do I actually start? I want to build an application. We've got this OS that's built around voice and context. But how do I, how do I translate my app? How do I build an entirely new app for this, this platform? And of course, it's good to start sketching. But at this stage, you're just looking at a blank piece of paper, and you're you know, kind of lost. So I want you to consider two thought experiments to kind of ground your thinking in how, how to approach wearable applications. So the first one's about voice. Now imagine that you are your app. And the only way that the user can communicate with you is through voice. So as the app, you're sitting in a room. Uh, it's a very nice white room. And the only thing in the room is a pedestal, and there's this red telephone on it. And when the user needs something, that telephone's going to ring, and then you're going to answer it, and it's the user, and they're going to say exactly what they need from the app. So what's the first thing that the user says when you pick up that phone? What's the range of calls that you're expecting to get throughout the day? How does the user phrase the request? And the great thing about building on top of Google's voice recognition system is that we're building out all of the capabilities. We're actually handing, handling all of the transcription and natural language processing and grammars. And all you have to do is just subscribe to a particular intent. Uh, but then the question is, which intents do you want? Uh, so as we're building up the system, we really definitely want to hear from you about the applications you're trying to build and which voice intents you're interested in. So we can start working on those and getting those into the system so that your apps can subscribe to them. So you can go to this form, uh, just fill out and tell us you know, what you're interested in the voice recognition system being capable of. And we'll show some examples of what it can currently do. So the second thought experiment is about context. And as Emmett said, even faster than voice is the application being able to anticipate the information that you need. So for here, I want you to think about this moment where a surgeon reaches out their hand. And immediately, without you know, ever, you know, having to look away, the tool that they need is placed in that hand. And what's interesting about context is contextual cards aren't meant to be surprises. Users are going to reach out their hand for your app at various times. They're going to adapt to the system as much as the system's adapting to them. And they're expecting the app to be there. So imagine that you're with the user, and you have the app ready. And you're ready to give the user the app at any moment. When do you expect the user to reach their hand out? What's going on in that situation? What's the environment? And then as you think about that, you can think about how you can build the contextual trigger conditions so that the card is there on their device at just the right moment. So we're almost ready to start sketching our app, but we still have this blank piece of paper. And one thing that's really useful for sketching applications is, of course, stencils. Uh, this is a stencil that uh, was made for Android phone applications, and it's really great. You, know, you have all the patterns, and you can quickly sketch out all of your screens. So then the question is, well, what does a stencil look like for wearable applications? So we, we started playing around with that, and we haven't actually built it, but here's a picture of what we think it would look like. So what's sort of interesting is, you know, of course, voice, right? We're just opening with speech bubbles, where you can you know, draw a speech bubble, sort of sketch what you expect the user to say. And then next, we have context, all of the contextual trigger conditions that Emmett was talking about. And only then do we move on to then sketching the actual UI on the watch, the card that appears, or the screen that's a result of the voice action. So let's look at some examples of voice. Um, you know, the talk's been pretty high level, but I want to run through some very specific examples, a few apps that are actually already available. So imagine you're going furniture shopping, and you see a new couch that you're interested in, you want to remember. You can just say, OK, Google, take a note. And apps can subscribe to the take a note intent. So in this case, Evernote uh, is the user's favorite note application, but it could be any number of note applications that the user likes to use. Say you're going for the run, back to Emmett's example. And as you're running, you're curious what your heart rate is. You can just say, OK, Google, what's my heart rate? And if the device has the sensor, that'll be available just with the quick voice command. And this is another intent that we currently support. Then at the end of the run, if you want to stop recording, you can just say, OK, Google, stop running. And apps can subscribe to that intent. So we have all of these uh, various natural language processing grammars built up for all the different ways that users can say these things. But from the app side, all they have to think about is they're subscribing to stop a run or take a note or what the, the basic intents are. Let's look at some examples for context. Uh, there's a few really good ones on Glass that are already shipping. This is uh, LinksFit. Uh, developers actually in the room. They did an awesome job. Um, it's all pod links. <laughs> so good. So how this works is it's going to use motion sensors um, to actually watch uh, you do the workout. And it, it, guides by speaking, it guides you by speaking to you um, and showing you quick little video clips. And it, it really works like a personal trainer would in real life in that it's giving you instructions and it's actually observing your motion. And this is great. I mean, it doesn't get more contextual than this. It's like actually recording each motion. Uh, another example of context is Field Trip, uh, where this shows you information about your surroundings. In this case, the user is interested in history, so they're seeing some historical information. This one's pretty crazy. It's uh, 9450. Uh, it uses a special basketball that has sensors that can uh, sense your shot style. 
and then gives you feedback on the shot on glass. Um, this is also kind of a good example of the world being the experience, because really the experience here is you're shooting a basketball. Um, but this is just giving you some additional data to help you have a better shot. Similar example with golf. This is Swing Bite, uh, which connects to a sensor on your club. And this uh, unlocks all sorts of really useful data as you're playing. Um, in some ways, it's, it's kind of like a caddy, but it's even more accurate than a caddy, because it has really detailed information. So let's look at some examples on where. So imagine uh, your friend has a Pinterest board of the best gummy candy in North America. And of course, you're going to subscribe to that. Uh, so you, know, you subscribed to it a long time ago. You've since forgotten. But as you're traveling and you're walking around, Pinterest fires. And it says, hey, the, one of the pins that you're interested in is actually in walking distance. You can go check it out. Because it, it knew that that was something that you're interested in. And this is, is uh, currently available. Another great application from Trulia. Um, this one's really cool. So as you're going to open houses, um, when you're uh, near the property, it's going to show information about the property. It gives you actions like you can call the agent. You can quickly favorite the property. And again, you know, this is very much the world is the experience. It's kind of like you're right clicking on the world. Um, it's like the world has a contextual menu where you can just say, you like, favorite this, this property, uh, which I think this one's really cool. All right, so let's look at a few more hypothetical examples. So imagine you're at home. Your device detects that you're at home. Gives you controls for your thermostat. Imagine you're going skiing and the conditions are pretty icy. But since in, uh, so you're, you're inside the grounds of the ski resort, your device could just tell you which lifts are running, which trails have been groomed, all of the contextual information that you want right then. Imagine you're at the airport. And as you're scrolling through your cards, you see that the airline that you're, you're on is uh, providing information on how many miles you've acquired um, and how you're doing. You're staying at a hotel, and the hotel chain recognizes that you're on one of their properties. They can give you quick access to actions, like requesting a late checkout. Imagine you're at a conference. Social network could tell you, hey, these, here's some friends that you have that you haven't actually seen in a long time, but they're also at the conference if you guys want to meet up. You're at a restaurant. A um, nutritional application could detect which restaurant chain you're in, quickly look up uh, nutritional information for that chain, and provide suggestions of the healthiest items on the menu. Say you're getting the oil changed in your car. You could have an assistant application that recognizes that and just offers to set a reminder for another six months. You're at the zoo, and you have a watch that automatically knows when the penguins are going to be fed. <laughs> Imagine if you're able to ask real-time location-based questions, and people using the service could choose if they want to respond. And these wouldn't be interruptive, but if you saw one come by as you're using the device and you felt like responding, you could help them out. So you know, questions that you could otherwise never search for, you could use, like saying, you know, are there any picnic tables free, and getting an answer to that. Imagine you're using a car sharing service. And as you approach the vehicle, you get a quick action to unlock the car. So what's sort of interesting about all those examples is that the UI wasn't actually that complicated. The UI is usually just a card or a button. And when you look at the stencil, you know, there's not much of the stencil devoted to the UI. This isn't about sketching a variety of different UI widgets. What the stencil is about is the, the user and their world. It's about what the user is going to say. It's about what the contextual trigger conditions are. Even with our mock-ups, we were focused more on sort of the background of the scene than when the device came up. So what's really important when thinking about these wearable applications is thinking about the world and what the user needs. And you know, we ran through a bunch of them, but this brings us back to our, our overall notion of the world being the experience. It's really being the thing that drives the use cases for these wearable applications. And you know, the world's a big place, so there's really a tremendous amount of opportunity for really interesting applications built in this space by designers and developers. Uh, Google's crafting the infrastructure with APIs for voice and context that you guys can build on. And it's, this is in the same spirit as our initial work on Google Now, but we're opening up the platform to the entire ecosystem for contextual cards and voice actions. And really, together, we'll be able to build things that are really far beyond anything that we could build on our own. So a quick announcement, which you may have heard in the last session. Uh, uh, if you're watching this on video, check out Timothy's session, Wearable Computing at Google. Uh, where notifications are going to start appearing on Glass in the next few months, which will make life much easier for developers, because they can develop for both devices simultaneously. And this will get you access to pages, stacks, voice replies, and actions. And with that, we'd love to take your questions. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Maybe not. Microphones in the center if yeah. uh, you want to step up to those. 
give people a second. Hi, um, I have a question about um, the where. Um, and uh, by looking at the SDK, it doesn't allow you to modify the notifications that you can post from um, your phone APK. Is there a reason why the design has been in such a way that the developer doesn't fully control the uh, um, layout of the notification? You have to actually build an APK for the where in order to uh, design a layout that uses the full screen. You're sort of bound in that tiny uh, right. square of the notification. What was the reasoning behind So the nice thing about developers using templates is then as new form factors come out, those notifications can be automatically adapted to the new form factor, uh -huh. um, which is, you know, even for where we have square and circular devices, right? So that, that's pretty useful. So it's, it provides less work for the developer when you're using one of those templates, because you just know you're sort of guaranteed for all future form factors. But you can, of course, create an activity view and control every pixel if you want. Um, then it's just more overhead for testing on the new devices and making sure everything's working correctly. Right. Is there a plan in the future where you would allow developers to completely custom design the layout of the mm -hmm. notifications? Yeah, that actually launched, launched today. Uh, the, the Wear SDK lets you do activity views and sidecards where you can do the full UI. Awesome. Thank you. No problem. Hi. Uh, my name is Jonathan. I want to ask. Um, when uh, will we see some more uh, sensors on the Android Wear devices? I mean, temperature, moisture, um, uh, some more. I mean, the LG doesn't have a heart rate, and most of the really interesting applications would be around the more sensors. Yeah, well, I think uh, as people are, are seeing the types of apps that developers want to build and the ecosystem's growing, we're going to see a lot of innovation in this space. I mean, one of the great things about Wear is we're going to have lots of devices. Um, so that will enable competition in the marketplace for people to to add sensors and have really cool use cases. Any uh, known watches coming out with I can't multiple sensors? <laughs> I'm not going to pre-announce other watches. But oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Theoretically, yeah. <laughs> hey, thank you all for the presentation. Um, so you've been mentioning all these uh, things where smart watches and smart glasses are similar, and how Android Wear is going to work uh, with both uh, glass and, and wear. Uh, and so, my question is exactly the opposite. Where do you see glass and smartwatches being totally different? What, what are the, and this is for any of you, what, what, what's, what's the, the feature where a smartwatch makes sense but glass doesn't and, and, and vice versa? You want to take that, Bob? Yeah. Sure. I, I think as uh, Timothy Jordan said in the last session, a lot of it, it does come down to the individual user, what people's preferences are. I think one thing I've found while working on wearable devices is they're much more like other things you wear, like shoes and socks and shirts and jackets and hats, and actually less like uh, phones and tablets in a lot of ways, in that you might one day wear one, another day wear another, uh, depending on what you plan to do that day. For example, uh, myself, I love to wear uh, the watch around my house. Um, it frees me from my phone, which can be downstairs, and I can still get my notifications. Um, but I love to wear glass when I'm cycling or when I'm playing with my uh, one-and-a-half-year-old son. Uh, it's the world's best baby camera. Um, so I'll take one off, put one on, depending on what I want to do that day. Um, I think that's probably the, the future of, of wearable technology is, is that sort of use case, very flexible, and people get to choose and customize for themselves. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Another thing to consider as an app developer is if the user has to maintain eye contact with something, uh, then glass is definitely better. So like the basketball example works really well on glass, but I don't think you'd necessarily want to be looking down at your watch while playing basketball. Um, so there's you know, some significant sort of form factor differences to consider for your specific case. My name is Julie Stanford, and I run a UX design agency called Slice Bread, where we do a lot of interactive prototyping like the kind you showed. Um, and we use a lot of HTML jQuery to do just quick Wizard of Oz prototypes. And I'm wondering um, if Android Wear is going to support doing that type of quick prototyping without having to go through creating a backend and da 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 da, da or if, you, if there's just some quick way to do rapid prototyping on that platform. Well, it should. Um, it doesn't currently. OK, um, but it will. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it should in theory. Um, yeah, it's, it's still pretty early. Uh, the team's been really focused on getting a product out before we've been able to do more robust things like you know, helping prototypers and stuff. Okay, so you can't just uh, like create something in HTML and quickly show it to see how it might work. No, it doesn't, okay. it doesn't have a rendering engine. All right. um, but, but I would say don't, don't let that discourage you. Yeah. Um, you know, strap a bicycle helmet to your head or a phone to your <laughs> oh, wrist. I'm not discouraged. We're, we're all designers. Yeah, we yeah. actually did a bunch in HTML and, and JavaScript prototypes. Um, 
and, and the, the real important thing is that you can just wear it and try it sure. in any way possible. You could also just draw to a smaller area of a phone screen and have people, right. yeah, I mean, yeah, that stuff works okay. Hi, uh, just a quick question. Um, I'm just thinking about, you know, on average, most people have like, I don't know, 50 apps, and there's a lot of competing apps and a lot of competing information, so let's say, you know, where should I eat tonight? Um, which card comes up? Something from Foursquare, something from Yelp? Or, you know, where should I stay tonight? Does Airbnb give me a suggestion or Hotel Tonight? I'm just wondering how does Wearable kind of tackle that? Or, I mean, Android Wear. So the, the first time you say it, um, if you have multiple apps installed or after you've installed a new application, the user has uh, a menu of choices they can choose for the application okay. at that, that moment. In the future, it's going to default to the one that you previously selected, but it gives you a moment to pause and choose one of the others, cool. which is kind of nice for voice, because you can say a command, drop your arm, and it's just going to happen. Or you could say a command and then quickly pause it and say, no, I want to switch over to this other service. Cool. Uh, also on the companion app, you can set which defaults are associated with everything. And in terms of the passive cards and the, the ranking of the order, is that determined by Google in terms of what's most relevant to you as you kind of scroll through the different types of cards? At the moment, it's determined by a number of signals that the developers are providing, uh, okay. priority levels. Um, in the future, we're looking at ranking based off of how contextual things are. Um, so it's, it's kind of working hand in hand with the developers to understand you know, what's important about their card and how it fits in. Cool. Hi, uh, my name is Conrad, and I work at the University of Washington. Uh, so I'm a grad student there. And there's a number of my colleagues are working on accessibility. And um, they're all really excited about wearables, because they're adding like, more input modalities for people that are blind or, uh, or they can't hear. Um, and it's all really exciting. And so I'm wondering, um, is your team working on any accessibility technologies with wearables? Like for instance, like you have a screen, and like, like you can put TalkBack, which is on Android phones, onto, onto watches as, as well. Are you working on anything like that? Yeah, I, I don't want to talk too much about what we're working on in the future, but I think something that is really exciting um, is uh, particularly with Glass, like the voice feedback. Um, mm -hmm. And building natural voice interactions, of course, are incredibly accessible. And they also benefit everyone, just as you know, like, uh, the sidewalk ramps benefit everyone. So uh, even if it's done initially for accessibility, it's super powerful uh, to give everyone access to it. And I think on the Glass platform, we've seen most innovation uh, for accessibility from third parties. A lot of it actually from academic sectors, people doing really innovative stuff. I think that um, from our point of view, we're trying to design more towards what I'd call universal access, which is how to make stuff that's um, as usable as possible for everybody. Um, but a lot of these ideas transfer over to the accessibility space. And of course, there's some that don't and some custom work that needs to be done. But the developer community has been amazingly productive in that space so far with Glass. And I expect to see more of that with Wear as the platform emerges. Right, thank you. Okay, um, I have a question regarding context. Uh, is, is it possible to provide um, custom contexts? So, for example, if, um, if I can actually um, have an algorithm that determines um, whether I'm in a noisy room or in a, um, a quiet place and, and, uh, or any other type of uh, custom context, is that something that I can uh, actually use to trigger uh, certain mechanisms in uh, wearables? Yeah, so, so from the user's point of view, we'd prefer to keep it really simple where they didn't need to do a lot of um, setting up uh, of trigger conditions and so on just to have things to appear. But I think you might be asking from an app developer's yeah. point of view, and we would absolutely encourage you to use every single signal possible to really focus and target content to the users. So all of those yeah. examples that you specified, I, I think, are, are great uh, signals and really paint that picture of what the user is doing. Um, so I'm, I'm asking if I can actually do a custom uh, context to, to, to create a trigger, a custom trigger. Yeah. So, so it somewhat depends on the hardware being used. So like for microphone, um, mm -hmm. you know, th yeah. that there's you know, permissions surrounding that. Um, also, there's battery uh, implications. Um, and the other aspect is we're trying to build uh, you know, systems that are pretty robust that everyone can benefit from. Like with activity detection, it's really hard to do machine learning on accelerometer data to figure out the difference between you know, biking and driving. So by us providing that to all the developers, then they, they get you know, all of that learning for free. Um, but for the things that you can access, yeah, we, we totally encourage you guys to build your own models of context. Um, it will give you a leg up in the market against your competitors if you're more contextual. Okay. And raw sensor data is available to you, for example, oh, yeah. in the accelerometer right. case. Like if you but, don't want to, you don't yeah, have you, to use those if APIs. If you have a better model, then but yeah. That, could that be triggered? I, I mean, I can't use that with a. I can't use that to trigger anything. Like raw accelerometer data. Accelerometer data is. Uh, it's not. 
I can't use that to trigger something from the background, right? Seems like maybe we can follow up afterward okay. and talk in more depth. Yeah. Uh, generally, you can put a card into the stream whenever you, you feel that it's contextual. We'll take uh, just one more question. Thanks. Well, this is crazy. You just stole my question. But I'll uh, add a little bit more. Um, do you have, you guys have been working on this space for a while now. Do you have any sort of like conceptual frameworks for thinking about multiplexing contextual data? You can often be overwhelmed by a particular signal or have a particular signal that is not represented as well. Is there any sort of um, more towards the theoretical side of like where to go to combine these things together? It would be a really good problem for us to have because like right now we're figuring out context and then matching that against all the available sources of information that have you know cards that can match. Um, at the moment, Android Wear is just launching now, so we don't have a tremendous number of applications. But it would be a great problem for us to have that suddenly there's you know, too many contextual cards for your environment, and then we have to think about ranking. And then that's sort of fundamentally a search problem, so I think we're hopefully pretty well equipped to tackle it. I'm, I'm looking forward to that being something we can work on. OK, thanks. So go forth and give us that problem. Yes, please. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks very much, everybody. Thank you.